Hello, everyone, and welcome to Clay ClayShareCon 2023. I'm Jessica Putnam Phillips, and we are starting off the afternoon session of day three with Drew Seymour from Clay Skates Pottery, and he has a kiln buying guide for you. This is such good information. Get your notebook, get your pen or pencil ready, and take notes. Also, Drew's gonna answer any questions you have, but if you have been thinking about buying a kiln or doing research into a kiln, or you're actually ready, like you know you're buying a kiln, you just don't know which one you want, then this kiln buying guide is for you. It's gonna give you lots of valuable information to help you get the right kiln for your financial budget, for your pottery needs, and also your electrical budget. That's really important too, because not everybody can run the same kind of kiln. And that's important to know when you're gonna buy them and invest into that much money. Okay, let's throw it on over to Drew at Clayscape so we can get going with the kiln buying guide. Hey, Drew. Hey, everybody, how's it going? I'm back, uh, day two for me, uh, day three, I know, uh, for um, ClayshareCon. And today Ooh. we're talking about kilns. Um, I have a little baby kiln here with me to kind of show off uh, just as like a display. Um, but we uh, are talking about buying kilns. And so if you've been thinking about, you know, finally taking the plunge and going out and getting a new kiln, um, or maybe you, you know, uh, see a used kiln somewhere on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace, and you want to know if that's going to work for your needs, these are the things that we're gonna be talking about here today. Um, and when we think about buying a kiln, we need to think about budgeting um, in a more than one way. Um, budgeting a dollar amount is always, is always what most people think about when they think of budget. Um, but what we also wanna think about is the available electricity that you have at your home or wherever your kiln is gonna be installed um, as well as the cubic footage of the kiln. You know, what are the things that you're making and are they going to, you know, what size kiln do you need to get to accommodate those um, materials or, or pieces of pottery? Um, and so I like to start on the small side. This is what's called the doll kiln. Um, I know Jessica has one. It's a baby kiln. Um, L and L is giving one of these away. Through that's right. We're guys. giving one away. Yeah, that's right. Um, on so Saturday. The, yeah, I think this is the exact model. Um, I think the main difference will be the, it probably as a touchscreen because I know L and L has moved. It's got the brand to, new controller. Yeah. Yeah. So the it's new, the fancy the new, new controller. Yeah, all of the new kilns coming out are all come with the Genesis controller standard. It's just um you know what they normally come with now and so um this is the size kiln that i like to use in the studio for all of my test tiles every time we make one of uh, our batches of glaze uh in the warehouse every batch of glaze goes through this kiln for a test firing um and so we really put these through their paces um this little guy here uh, will work on pretty much any electrical budget and when we say electrical budget what I'm talking about are the amps, the amperage required to fire your kiln. Um, when we get into larger sizes, um, where you're looking at either the, um, you know, an 18 inch diameter or a 20 inch diameter kiln, these are all interior dimensions. Um, the, the larger you get, the more energy is required to heat that kiln space, that interior kiln space up. Um, and so they're going to require a larger breaker size. So one thing that you'll have to decide, uh, find out when you're thinking about buying a kiln is, well, how many amps do I have available at my house? You know, if I have 200 amp service and it costs me, you know, every time you turn a piece of electronics on in your home, it's taking up some of that budget that you have so you have a total of 200 amps and 30 of those amps go to the washing machine and 30 of those amps go to the you know electric stove or oven and however many amps for the lights and all of that and so you add all of that up and you figure out you know well do i have available amperage to put in uh you know a 60 amp breaker to fire a larger kiln and um, and so any, I also recommend 
you know, contacting uh, an electrician. And if you're ever confused, you know, having an electrician come out and say like, well, you know, this is what you have, this is what you have available. Um, they can do that um, fairly easily. Um, you know, older homes, I know there are, are older homes, you know, built back in the early 1900s um, where you may only have a hundred amp service. And so putting in a kiln is difficult. It may require you to get upgraded service from the pole um, and all of that. So it's not as easy as just finding a hundred dollar used kiln, grabbing it and then saying, plug it in. It's going to work. Right. When we moved studios, we moved mm -hmm. to a house that was older and didn't have updated electric. And we had to have a whole nother electrical panel put in on the other side of our house to run the kilns off of. And, you know, we had to have an electrician come out. We had to get um, the electric company involved to make sure that could happen. So I almost think before you buy a kiln, you should know about your electrical situation. If yes. you can even put a kiln in, because yeah. if you can't, then you've got to think, you know, outside the box yeah. a bit about how you're going to fire your work. And Absolutely. I have to tell you, um, the cost of the electrical work was probably more than the kiln for me. So people check into the electric. Yeah, you definitely want to know your electrical situation before you buy your kiln. Um, I can't tell you how many times, you know, if somebody's, and this is also one of the reasons we don't, I don't put pricing on, um, any of our kilns on our website. Um, I prefer, and, and the reason we have it the way we do is you have to get a hold of us and contact us to purchase your kiln because there are questions that need to be asked before you can just click the buy button. And so I can't, I can't tell you how many times somebody's bought a kiln and it's been delivered. And then I get the phone call, Hey, this kiln's not working. You know, what's going on? You know, I bought this kiln online somewhere and I, you know, and it turns out, you know, that it's the wrong phase or it's the wrong voltage or, you know, they don't have enough voltage or, or something has gone wrong in the electrical um, diagram uh, that they didn't know about ahead of time. And so being armed with that knowledge will make your kiln buying process a lot easier. Um, you know, the other thing you want to think about is, you know, down the road, you know, who's going to be doing the maintenance on the kiln? Is this something that you are going to be able to, in you know, say in five years, are you going to be replacing the elements? Or is, are you going to have to hire somebody to come out and replace the elements? Um, I mentioned that because if you are not going to be the one working on your kiln, but you have a local clay supplier and they do kiln work, you know, you want to buy a kiln that they are familiar with. Um, you know, as much as I would love to sell a kiln to everybody out there that wants a kiln, you know, if you live in the middle of the country and I don't, you know, go there cause it's far away, um, you know, <laughs> Who's going to work on your kiln and are they familiar with the type of kiln that you want to get? You know, so, oh, you know, supporting your local clay supplier, uh, you know, finding out what kilns that they use and what kilns that they're familiar with um, can also be a, a tipping factor in deciding, you know, whether or not you're going to go with one brand or another. Um, you know, we sell L&L &L and uh, we have all L&L &L kilns in our studio. Um, we sell Scott and Conart kilns as well. But if, uh, you know, if somebody came and wanted a, a Cress, for example, you know, I may, you know, we don't work with Cress. So down the road, when that needs repair work, it's going to be more um, billable time because we have to figure out and monkey around with a kiln we're not familiar with. Um, so, so, you know, we, we love L and L uh, we sell those. This is the, the baby doll kiln that we have here. Um, we are doing a promo on L and L kilns, by the way. Um, so if you guys are looking for kilns, we are running a promotion where if you buy a kiln, an event, we will cover the cost of the shelf kit or the furniture kit for you. Um, and that's and just... And I think people don't realize that when you buy a kiln, you have to buy a furniture kit. Yes. So and Those one are thing, the shelves and posts. Yeah. You have one to the, have them. One, or of the other, one of the other ways that we do things here, at least here at Clayscapes, um, we like to be very transparent with how much everything is. 
And so, you know, we don't do, we don't usually do like free shipping or, you know, free event or anything like that. Anything that we do is, is going to be upfront. Um, and so when, when you go to buy a kiln, it, when you see that price tag, it is for just the kiln, right? And so the shelf kit and the vent, all of those are added on after the fact. And so you just keep in mind, uh, and that's where we would get into, you know, your, your monetary budget and, and figuring that out. Um, you know, so and you're then doing finally, a promo right now too, where you are yes. actually getting a free kiln. Yes. And so that's kit. very, we usually do that about, we do that once a year typically, and it's for clay share con. And so anytime we're going to run a promo, um, you know, we'll let you know, but that is, so that's like, now through i think march 11th is the last day so that promo goes through the 11th because i know that you know people may need to get a hold of their electricians and see you know th those things take time and so we we'll ex we extend the promotion for kilns um an extra week out there for you guys um you know then the finally you got to think about what are you making you know, are, are you making a lot of flat work? Are you making a lot of tall work? Is your work heavy or dense? You know, if you're making bonsai planters and you want to make like big chunky work that's groggy and has lots of texture, um, you know, that work is dense. It has a lot of thermal mass. And so, you know, figuring out what kiln to get based on the work that you're making is also um, kind of a rubric where for, you know, what kind of kiln that you guys want to get. Um, so this is, you know, this fits a mug. It fits more than a mug. That mug's ridiculously big. So I will I tell fit, you that- I can the, fit three or four of these in there. I can put a plate and four mugs in the test kiln but I can also have about 30 test tiles in there. Yeah, I can have a yeah. whole bunch of other small pieces going in there. If I'm doing jewelry, I can fill the kiln right up. It holds the um, little jewelry tree holder that I have and, yes. and a whole bunch of other yeah. stuff in there. So the, the test kiln might not be for everybody, but I do think for somebody like me and you and other potters that do a lot mm -hmm. of production work, a test kiln is a valuable tool to have in our studio. Now, uh, folks are asking if you could explain the difference between a 120 or, or 110 with a top temp of 220 or versus a um, 240, like the different voltages and what you're getting. Sure. Like, what do you want for a kiln? Typically, uh, so anything that runs on a 120 is you're going to be able to run it on a variable outlet on a regular plug somewhere you'll have to put in a you know a 20 amp breaker or something but basically they're designed to run on your everyday residential electrical circuit um at the wall i tend to not recommend those ever um in certain situations um you can be limited especially if you are a renter you know if you rent an apartment or a townhouse and that's the only thing available and to get the landlord to move electrical power somewhere can be a real big pain in the pain in the neck. Um, and so that's what you have to work with those kilns um, like this size kiln wired on a 120 is only going to be rated to cone five or six. So it's maximum temperature is going to be that mid range cone five cone six. Um, those kilns are really good for testing. And they're really good for low fire work. Um, but if you're firing mid range, you're going to want to go to 240 no matter what. Um, and so, you know, like this kiln here is going to be wired for 240. It's got a maximum temperature of cone 10. It'll do cone five, six all day, every day. Um, and, and it'll be good to go. Um, really the doll kilns, the and the test kilns they're the only kilns out there that are going to run on that 110 or 120 anything bigger than this and you're automatically going to have to go to a 240 volt or the 220 volt kilns and those kilns run on um thicker gauge wire they're going to run on uh outlets similar to 
your stove or your washer dryer machines. Um, those are larger plugs and they just require more power. And so um, in order to supply that power, you need um, heavier duty wire, heavier duty outlets and things like that so that you don't you know, have a fire. Um, the other thing that people tend to forget are um, kilns are really pieces of machinery, they're equipment. Um, and a lot of times people kind of view them as appliances. So when we, you know, get a kiln from the, you know, when you buy a kiln and it comes in and you plug it in and you're ready to use it, you know, it's going to require a certain amount of firings to dial it in and make the adjustments to the thermocouples and things like that. It's not meant to be like, a, you know, like a microwave where you just boop, 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 and it, and it does its thing, you know. So these are, you know, this is, uh, these are machinery, they're equipment. Um, they are, they require, um, a little bit more knowledge to, you know, and so, you know, learn, learning about your kiln is, you know, is, is also comes with part of the territory. They have, uh, you know, pretty massive, you know, little handbooks with lots of information in there. Um, but yeah, the, if you're firing mid range, you want 220, 240, um, all day. You don't want to really mess around with anything that's got the 110 outlet. So we had a, a question. Could you, since you do sell scuts in L and L, can you compare the two for folks so they can know a bit yeah. about each? I think yeah, people absolutely. really know about scut kilns. Um, there's a lot more advertising for scut out there, and yes. not as many people know about L and L. And so well, I, you know, I have my personal opinion about kilns, and I think all kilns are like cars. You get your yeah. favorite. And I like to compare L &L. To, uh, <laughs> I like to I like to compare Scott and L and L to like Nike and Reebok, right? Like they're it's a brand thing, right? And so Scott has an excellent brand uh, presence. They have um, they have been in in business selling their their kilns for uh, I believe a longer period of time. I'm not positive on that, but I know that they are West Coast. And L and L is East Coast, right? So L and Ls are manufactured in New Jersey. Scuts are manufactured in Portland, I think, Portland, Oregon. Um, and so they're both top of the heap as far as I'm concerned, right? If we, if you were to ask for like best quality, you know, top loading electric kilns on the market, it's going to be L and L, Scott and then Conard. Um, those three companies are, you know, they're the, you know, they're Nike and Reebok. They're the, you know, the home name, brand name kilns that people know. And so the biggest difference between Scott and L&L &L is the element holders in the L&L. &L. Um, so the L&L &L kilns have these little element holders. So you can see these elements sit in these hard ceramic tracks. And so rather than rather than your elements being put into your right into your soft brick, um, they go into these hard ceramic tracks. That comes in that that becomes the most important thing when you have to replace elements. And instead of having to pull these little metal pins out of every corner, to get the and then you wind up damaging your brick and that's in the scut and, that has yeah, that and then you have to yeah. repin everything and so the the amount of time you spend doing repair work is way way less on an l and l you know something that i could do in maybe three hours on a scut um i could do in an hour on an l and l you know something that would take four or five hours on a scut i could do in two hours on an l and l and so the ease of repair for the L and L's is a lot, lot lower. They're way easier to do, um, you know, maintenance on, um, their control boxes for the L and L kilns on their bigger kilns. Um, they open in a way that makes it really simple and effortless to get at the electrical components and do repair work. Whereas on a scut, that all kind of hangs, loosely here and in order to do any kind of work on it you have to completely remove it from the kiln 
um, to intuitively get at the parts you need to get at. So it's just a much um, a much easier uh, maintenance routine on the L and Ls, and then the brick wind up lasting so much longer that you don't have to do brick work. Um, and so I find that the L and Ls are much better kilns in the long run. They really hold their value a lot a lot longer than other kilns on the market. Um, that's not to say that Scott or Conart or any other kilns are not good. I just find that the L and Ls are better. Um, well, I want to, yeah. And I want to chime in on this. So the first kiln I got was a secondhand L and L and it was already 30 years old when I got it. The kiln's now 50 years old and I can still use it. So that's <laughs> saying something, right? Yeah, yeah. The first kiln I bought with my, that I bought brand new was a Scut because I had only seen advertisements for Scut. I didn't really look into L and L, so I didn't consider L and L. And I used that Scut for 10 years. And it was fine. But as Drew has mentioned, those pins, when I replaced the elements, were always letting bits of brick fall when I'd load the shelves in. If you bump the side, that soft brick would crack. Some of it would fall off. Also, uh, there was some other things. I, did, I wasn't really happy with the wear of my scut. So when it was time for me to get a new kiln, I contacted Drew. I met Drew by then. And I got we an l, &L. You, you did. I got the same yeah. size as I had. My, I sold my scut to my apprentice. And I got my first new L&L. And, &L, and mm -hmm. now I got my baby kiln. And then I have a large E23S too. So I've got four L&L &L kilns. And I will not buy another electric kiln for me. L&L. &L, and also those of you concerned about changing elements, you can do it yourself. Uh, oh, I yeah, have, we have videos. Easy. Drew came and we filmed videos. One, I went to him. I think, mm -hmm. did we do the L&L &L with you? We did the L&L &L here. And, the and Scott then you came to house. me. And we yep. did the scut at my studio. So I've got videos on showing you how to change scut and L and L. So those of you who are concerned, you can change your own elements and you kind of want to because the savings getting yeah. someone out is going to cost you more than double. You know, I can yeah. use, you know, all for this kiln, I could do all of the repair work with a Phillips head screwdriver and a pair of pliers, right? Like literally fill two, two, two tools. And you could pretty much do all of the re repair work on this kiln. Um, the, the other thing is the, well, there was another thing that I want to, oh, the, the Allen L kilns come with the thermal couples in each section. So if you get a three section kiln, it's got three of these sections, every section has its own thermal couple. So we're measuring temperature in multiple zones and the computer, the controller, um, if one of the zones lags behind in temperature, it will auto correct so that you get a more even firing. Um, there that are things huge that you can too. do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the and three you know, thermal it, couples in the big kiln. Yeah. The three thermal couples is huge because, you know, I know in a kiln that's only got one thermal couple, it's very easy, you know, to be a complete, a cone difference from the top to the bottom. You know, you could have a hot six on the top and a five on the bottom if you only have one thermal couple. And, and that, having a thermal couple in each section changes the way we think about how it needs to be loaded evenly. It will change the way you fire your kiln so that everything is even. Um, and so that is also a really big one, especially if you're doing a lot of flat work, you know, a lot of tiles or plates, or you're worried about warpage and, and, you know, evenness of firing. If you have a glaze that's very particular and you want to fire a crystalline glaze program, for example, um, you know, having that thermal couple measure temperature in each zone to make sure that it's doing what it needs to do um, can become really useful down the road. It can be frustrating because it will throw an error code if the kiln is not loaded properly. But once you overcome that frustration of relearning how to load your kiln, um, your results will be better because of that. Um, and so, you know, and, you know, that is an option. You can always get, you know, an added on, you know, I think Scott has the option to get uh, the extra thermal couples in your kiln, but that is just, um, that's just, you know, factory bare minimum for the L&Ls. And, &Ls. and so a lot of folks are commenting about um, they, they sometimes have it hotter on the bottom or hotter on the top. 
With my mm-hmm. scut, I always had that as an issue. It was always hotter top. on the top yep. and cooler because on heat the rises. bottom. So yeah. because heat rises, your top it can be hotter. Kilns will always try to will will always trend towards being hotter on the top and cooler on the bottom. There's a couple ways that we fix that. The the downdraft kiln vents really help solve that a lot because they vent from the un, from underneath the kiln. That air draft is pulling the air down in the kiln. That's going to help even out your kilns firing. But then also having the thermal couple in each zone, you know, it can say, oh, the top is too hot. And it'll sit and it'll tell the top, hold, hold, hold. It won't fire. It won't fire until the bottom catches up. And then once the bottom catches up, it'll fire the whole thing together. And so just having that flexibility um, is, is, is a huge thing. You know, I don't have to worry about having, you know, a hot top. So here in the U.S., we mostly have top-load electric kilns. I see a few people asking about front-load electric kilns. They're not yeah. as popular. There are a few models available. LNL does make a couple. And yes. uh, you want to talk about them? Do you sure. carry those? Can you get those? So you can get front-loading kilns. Typically, I, if you're an individual and you're calling asking about a front-loading kiln, a lot of the times I won't sell you one. Um, and that mostly has to do with delivery and getting it into the house. Um, those front loading kilns, uh, unlike the top loading kilns, which are all sectional, you can take them apart, right? Like a front loading kiln, they ship and they are built to order, um, complete. And so you need special equipment to get it into the building. You need, um, you know, the electrical specs, for those front loaders are a lot more heavy duty. Uh, they're production model kilns. They're designed for collegiate level, um, you know, industrial buildings where they've got, you know, unlimited power um, and they can just fire whatever they want. Um, and most people think, you know, and there is this kind of this myth that front loading kilns are better for your back than top loading kilns. You know, you're gonna save your back because you're not gonna be bending over that top loader. And so, you know, it's better for you. When in reality, that's not the case. Um, You know, those front loading kilns, um, instead of leaning over this kiln all the way in, like like a swimming pool, you know, I have to be able to load shelves up and in like this. And so this part of your back, right here can get a lot more damage. So that's kind of a myth where when you think front loaders are better for you than top loaders, um, you can get more pots in a front loader because they're square or rectangular. You know, the dimensions are not octagonal, um, but you could just get a square or a rectangular top loader um, and you'll be able to get the same kind of stacking space. So, um, you know, people grow up going to school and they see the front loaders and they're, they're really nice and, and all that. But the, I mean, they're for the price of a front loader, you could buy two top loaders. That's the other thing is they're just a lot more expensive. So it's, it's rare that a front loader is necessary. Um, especially in an individual setting. Like you're not gonna save your back, you're not gonna save money. And unless you are in an industrial building where they have like a loading dock, um, it's not gonna get delivered properly. Um, And you don't, and there's nothing worse than getting a kiln that you've been waiting, you know, 20 weeks on to come in and then, you know, damage it because you don't have the proper way to move it through the the space that needs to be moved so so it's just there's just a lot of limitations with the with the front loaders that people don't run into normally and so they don't think you know if you if you don't if you're not expecting something like that to happen it's not even part of your mind and you go and so that's all you know so we're just top loaders are better I think it depends, though, on t- the way some people work. Some people really love a front load, but I think yeah. a lot, a lot of times, top load is is easier for folks, and it's just the if thing that sells the most work. in America. Yeah, 
big work. The, the, the one place that the front loader becomes much, much more useful is if you work in big work. You know, if my work was the size of this kiln, the, if this was the pot, a front loader is way easier because I don't have to lean over to get this monster into the bottom of a kiln, right? That is an issue. And so if your work is, if you work in, you know, in size, if you're working in large dimensions, that's where the front loaders um, really shine, you know, because you can just put it there and it takes up the whole thing and you're good. Um, but if you're just doing, you know, everyday wear, if we're just doing, you know, your, the clay share projects, unless you're making, you know, massive work, um, you're not going to see the benefits of that front loader until you do. But so. that's why folks should call you and talk about their pottery needs right. because right. there's going to be the, no one size or shape kiln fits all. Right. Everybody's got their own specific needs. And that's why, you know, me, I ended up having to buy another kiln because my work started getting bigger, but it was still flat. It was big platters and stuff. Yep, and yep. I had to buy a kiln that was lower, but wider so the that wider. I could get those bigger pieces in. So that's why it's really important. If you are only making like tall, skinny pieces, you there's a kiln for you. So it's always Sweet. really good to think about what you're doing. Also, people should leave a little room for growth and expansion in their work. That's <laughs> true. You know, a test where do you like see that? yourself going yeah, in, your, exactly. in your ceramic adventure in life, right? You know, is this something that you're doing because, you know, just because you love it and it keeps you busy and you're, you're perfectly happy to make whatever you want and just give it away to family. But if you, you know, if you're looking down the road and you go, you know what, in two years, I could see myself, you know, doing a little, uh, you know, the farmer's market and maybe getting a tent and maybe trying to sell some of my work. Um, you know, you may want to think, you know, okay, well, maybe you get uh, a kiln one size up from what you're thinking about um, because that's going to allow you room to grow as an artist as well as, you know, in a business sense. Um, and so, you know, all of those questions are things that, you know, we will ask, you know, we will ask if someone calls up and says, Hey, I'm looking to buy a kiln. And sometimes they say like, I want this kiln, you know? And so we still want to be able to ask those questions because, the, you know, there may be something comes up that you hadn't thought about and, and another kiln may work better for you. Um, and so there's, you know, there's different lines. L and L sells the easy fire kilns, which are, they're, they're most popular because everything's built in, right? This computer, everything's inside this little box right here, right? But, you know, if you as an artist are, um, you know, if you want a really big kiln, if you're looking for a 10 cubic foot kiln and you want to put it in at home, you know, we may move you to a Jupiter, which is a L and L kiln. It's a different series of kilns that they make and they're designed with maneuverability and, in mind, they have higher electrical specs. Um, they're more of a production kiln. And so there's just, there's, there are a lot of factors that, you know, may nudge us in one way or another um, to give you the kiln that's going to best suit your needs so that you're not sitting there for six months trying to fill this huge monster of a kiln before you fire it. But you're also, you know, you don't want to buy something that you're going to fire every night because it's so tiny, you know? Um, so yeah, there's just lots to think about when you're buying your kiln, but you don't have to think about brands because you can just buy an L and L because they're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> they're awesome. What if someone is having a kiln that's firing, hotter on the bottom than the top what's going on so it could be um a loading issue um there are other uh, uh, typically if you're firing hotter on the bottom i would expect that to be um you could you know it could be a stuck relay um it could be that the elements on top are actually wearing a little bit more and therefore they're not firing at peak performance um you know, uh, I would start with a loading issue, though. I would probably figure, you know, if you find out, you know, well, if it's hot on the bottom 
and and light on the top does that mean that there's more more is it more densely loaded in the top you know is there more thermal mass is there more stuff in the top than in the bottom you know you want to put plates on top so you know do you have you know a tall stack in the bottom and then a lot of flat work so multiple layers uh, that can cause it to fire unevenly and so these are things that we think about when we're when we're loading you know you want to make sure that it's even and if you're if you have that unevenness um that's what i would think if it's you know it could also be that it needs a thermal couple adjustment it's possible that you know it's it's not calibrated right and so you know we would want to put witness cones in to find out and see what needs adjustment where. Could you go over the uh, touch screen or the controller and if you can use it with Wi-Fi and all that? Yeah, uh, I don't have one here with me, but the, the nice thing about that I like about the touch screen is I think it's a lot easier to use. With this number pad, you... The, the way that it's set up is it has menus. And so you kind of cycle through the menus. With the touch screen, everything is really, like you, you can get a lot more information. And so it's really just a few button presses. Um, the other thing with the touch screen controllers are they attach to Wi-Fi. So if you've got, say you've got a, you know, a separate garage that's not attached, you know, but you know, you can plug your kiln in there you can connect it to Wi-Fi, and then when you're inside, you can have an app that will keep track of it and things like that. Um, I like the, it's got more functionality than these. The touchscreen controllers have self-diagnostics on them, so you can go through and do um, you know, an element diagnostic or a relay diagnostic, and it'll run through its little you know, beep, boop, beep, boop, beep, boop. And then it'll tell you, you know, if your relays need to be replaced. Um, and you can also plug in, I, you can plug in your um, cost per kilowatt hour, how much your electricity costs. And then when you fire your kiln at the end, when it completes, you can go through and look at the menus and it'll tell you exactly how much uh, money this firing costs you. So, you know, whatever your firing costs are. Um, the touchscreen controllers also have graphs and charts so that like they automatically have all that stuff. Um, they're just all around, you know, have more functionality and I think are a lot easier when it comes to programming. Um, so, so the touch screens are coming out in March is my understanding. I spoke with LNL because the new test, the doll kiln that we're giving away is gonna have the touch screen. And yes. I was told those wouldn't be shipping out till March. Okay. So. What do you, you have kilns in stock now? If somebody wants to buy a kiln, you have kilns in stock now that have the Genesis controller. I have a couple. Or do you kilns have any in kilns? Stock. In the, I have a couple. Yeah. Kilns so if somebody wanted a kiln right now. If you wanted a kiln right few. now, I would say call me. But it's probably if not, you're waiting twenty weeks. Oh uh, no, twenty weeks is if you want like a front loader. These are six okay. to eight weeks. Six to eight okay. weeks. The, so the our lead time on kilns. Um, Scott and LNL and Conart, the, you know, last year, the lead times were huge. They were like 20 weeks. Um, all of those companies have gotten down to like six to eight weeks. Um, oh, well, this hello. is Gabe. Gabe's there. Hi, Gabe. Um, <laughs> but no, they're all six to eight weeks now. And so, um, you know, if you were to place an order today for a kiln, um, you're probably looking at what late April, early May. Um, but the few you have in stock, people could have much. Yeah, they could have them now. So uh, you know, and there, you know, I have a couple of doll <laughs> kilns in stock. We've got a couple of bigger kilns in stock, um, but there we don't have as many in stock as we did last year, just because the the turnaround time is a lot better now. And this way, you know, every kiln is built to order. And so this way we're not stuck with inventory that we can't get rid of. Um, so that's all. So um, those of you uh, mentioned about the LNL touchscreen, this is a new touchscreen that hasn't been released yet. So nobody has it. Yeah, it so the Genesis, the, Genesis the Genesis with the touchscreen. It'll probably the Genesis be the Genesis 3. three. 
So there yes. it'll be the third iteration of the Genesis controller, and that it's super um, spanking brand new. Nobody's got spiffing. it yet, and the person who's going to probably get it first is the one who's going to win that doll kiln. Yeah, I bet. I bet that'll be the first one they get off first the line. First person, yeah, get it, and uh, we'll know tomorrow who won. <laughs> <laughs> we don't we don't pull the names you know we don't pull no. the winners until a few until hours before of. yeah the day of so if you haven't signed up on clayshare.com for our emails yet that's how you enter if you're a premium member you're automatically entered guys go Absolutely. just be a premium member then you don't have to worry about email list or any of that stuff you're just it's just done for you it's um there. so folks folks have all kinds of questions about kilns there's so much stuff to cover uh, i know we can't cover them all now the best thing I think is for you all to reach out to Drew at Clayscapes say, Pottery. Yeah, absolutely. And the Drew best is, at um, ClayscapesPottery.com. Dot com. Email. Send me an email. Email um, Drew. Andrew, Andrew though. Drew. Email Andrew. Andrew. I know I called him Drew. <laughs> Andrew is his full name, and that's what his email is. So it's yes. Andrew at ClayscapesPottery.com. Dot com. And I do recommend if you're thinking of getting a kiln, even if you don't buy a kiln from Clayscapes, reach out to Drew because yeah. he will help you. I know many people who've bought kilns from Andrew and many people who have just had Andrew help them buy a kiln. Yeah. So give me a, you know, give me a call. Just have somebody there. I mean, like I said, even if you don't buy it from us, you know, just the reassurance that you are buying something that is going to work for you is is everything and you know not and not having to wonder like after you've hit that purchase button you know two weeks down the road going man should i have gotten a bigger kiln should i have you know should i have you know gotten this upgrade or that upgrade or you know do i need it you know there are some times when you know you can say okay well i have say i've got a five thousand dollar budget you don't necessarily need to spend all of that money to get a kiln that's going to do everything you need. And so, you know, there's a lot of times where I've had people say, this is the kiln that I'm looking at getting. And I can say, well, you don't need the quad element upgrade, or you don't need the type S thermal couples. You know, there are upgrades that are on the market that, you know, if you're just looking to spend a certain amount of money, yeah, you can get those, but they're not going to do anything for you. You know, you're not going to see a return on that investment. Um, and so to, you know, to buy it would be pointless. And, you know, I don't have a problem. You know, I'm not, I'm not interested in taking all your money, right? You know, let's, <laughs> so we'll just get <laughs> the thing that works the best for you and, um, you know, and everybody will be happy. Yeah. And, and that's the key is getting the best kiln for you. All right, Drew, we've got 10 seconds left. Anything last you want to say before we go? Don't forget about the big deal. Yeah, the discount. Don't going. forget to use 2023 on the Clayscapes website for your glazes. And if you want a kiln, shoot me an email. We're running the promo through the end of next week. So get yourself a new kiln. Thank you so much, Drew, for being here with us and part of ClayshareCon 2023. We always love having you. Drew's been with us since day one of ClayshareCon. So yeah. he's been, he's been throughout the whole thing with us. <laughs> so you, you know how I feel about kilns. I've had, I've had many kilns. I've used every kiln out there basically. And L and L are my favorite for electric kilns. I have to say, um, they're a great kiln, but there really is no wrong kiln. It's just finding the right kiln for you. So you just, you might use a different kiln that works fabulous for you. That's great. So. I just have my opinion because I know what I use today and what I would put my, you know, my hard earned money, what I'm going to buy with my money. And that's going to be another LL kiln, which I have an E28S L&L kiln that I'm waiting to get delivered hopefully this summer. So uh, I'm pretty excited for that one, joining the rest of the, the other three. So the four L&Ls can live together and chat and hang out. All right. Next, we're gonna be having, let's see, I got so excited about the kilns, I forgot who was coming on next. We have Creating with Leaves with Michael Harbridge. And that is gonna be coming back with him at 1.30. Before we go, I quickly wanna remind you, don't forget about getting your glazes from Clayscapes. You can get my new Celadons and all of their awesome glazes that they have. Plus they have a whole bunch of things that are 20% off. Use the code 2023. You can find all of the discounts and deals and promos on Claysharecon.com along with the schedule of this entire conference. Tomorrow we're gonna be giving away that LNL kiln along with a speedball wheel, not to the same person, 
two separate people. Going to be a very happy person with a new kiln, a very happy person with a new wheel at the end of the day tomorrow, along with dozens of other prizes that have been generously donated by all of our sponsors. All right, I'm going to take a quick break. Be back at 1.30. See you all then.